and uh, uh, okay so good morning everyone uh, i'm very glad that we could start this uh, fellows curriculum and uh, we have today's uh, speaker dr manda ragashtri now this idea came to me when i was a fellow at sikkis we have uh, falters day or uh, a uh, mercer rank day when an external faculty would come and interact with fellows of sikkids and the no local faculty was part of that meeting and similarly i wanted my fellows to interact with the nationally proclaimed uh proclaimed uh, staff so i in invite dr manda ragashe today to talk about safe surgical dislocation its technique indications we have couple of interesting cases so the first module is a pediatric hip module and you will eventually see coxavara ddh and scafi uh, talks over first 5 weeks so uh, i wish you all the best uh, happy learning and shalin please take over this meeting shalin is uh, the coordinating fellow today thank you very much thank you sir so we'll start with the first talk of the of the day so it will be by dr mandar sir and he'll talk us through the basic uh, approach to a child with scafi and uh, he'll talk on the modified done technique for scafi over to you sir yeah uh, thank you mallin and um, ortho kids ahmedabad for inviting me for this and and it's it's really a great privilege to um, start of this teaching schedule with uh, uh, molin i'm i'm sure uh, it will be uh, the entire sessions all the sessions which have been planned by molin so meticulously are going to be a great help to the fellows uh, today what we'll do is we'll talk about uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis and uh, also a few other indications of doing a doing a safe surgical dislocation now uh, for for me when when i was a fellow in in uh, uh, in in mumbai most of the most of the treatment of slip capital femoral epiphysis used to be in situ pinning and i am really i would like to acknowledge two of my teachers dr hari shoshalkar and dennis wenger at san diego who really introduced me to this concept of safe surgical dislocation and i would like to really acknowledge dr prasad gaurineni who uh, with his frequent visits to mumbai really taught me about the details about the small steps which really helped us uh, help help me over the years um, i would also like to acknowledge three of my uh, seniors friends philosophers guys whatever you call them so dr sandeep vaidya dr sandeep patwardhan and venkat from from anga uh, i i usually many, many a time bounce off my cases to them on whatsapp and they give me great advices uh, uh, when when i have to do it all right so so let's go to slip capital femoral epiphysis and we know that scfe is basically a varus and posterior slippage of the capital femoral epiphysis it's one of the very common adolescent hip disorder so almost every time when when you see a child who is about 14 or 12 or 14 or so years who is slightly obese and comes with an abnormal gait with a thigh and hip pain we always have to think of the hip and think of scfe um we know that it is a type 1 physeal injury it's a slow salter harris type 1 slip which is going through the proliferative and the hypertrophic zones and unlike a typical salter harris injury it's it's a very slow process which happens and that is why the anterior periosteum just goes on slipping and uh, uh, the 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 callus starts forming so it's not going to be a simple type 1 delbay fracture it's something which is a slow process with its own reparative process in mind so what happens is that slowly this anterior metaphysis starts getting hitting against hit against the acetabulum that leads to cartilage and labral damage that leads to femoral acetabular uh, uh, impingement and degenerative joint disease uh, so uh, secondly what we have to know is the classification of slips 
the classification of slips is temporal one of the first classifications is temporal which is a pre slip where there is just a widening and irregularity of physis an acute slip now remember acute slip is never just one day it's less than three weeks so even in an acute slip there is a process of a slow slippage of the physis it is within three weeks and the only characteristic of an acute slip is that there is no callus formation as we know there is some time required for callus formation so less than 3 weeks is the time for callus formation so if you don't see a callus and an acute uh, or acutish presentation it's an acute slip chronic slip is the time when it is more than 3 weeks while the common presentation in india is something which is an acute on chronic slip that is where there is symptoms of more than 3 weeks in duration and there is a sudden increase in symptoms however what is important to know that this does not predict avian what does predict avian is what was described by randall loader in 1993 into a very simple thing i think it's a very simple concept a stable and an unstable slip where stable means he is able to bear weight with or without crutches and unstable he is just not able to bear weight now this as we as i told you it's a very simplistic classification there are cases where they are in the border between stable and unstable and there have been situations where a child who is able to bear weight when we do a surgical dislocation there is a lot of instability in the physis ne ek model hota bol ne ne ek dusra asta aplya yacha sarkha model all right sorry so he is able to uh, there is an instability in the physis so there is a good correlation between the risk of avian and the stability of the slips so in stable slips the risk of avian in only is only about 1% while in unstable slips it's a very very high chance of avian with or without your treatment it's about 10 to 60% in various studies we know the severity classification it's a simple yeah. south classification <laughs> 30 to 60% and more than 60% once we know this we should know the goals of treatment the first and foremost is prevent further slip progression if you are unable to treat a slip in a manner where you are able to reduce the slip at least the thing we should do safely is reduce further slip progression or prevent further slip progression and that is the concept of in situ training second is if possible restore proximal femoral anatomy and at the same time prevent the complications of avian which can be iatrogenic and finally femoral acetabular impingement and degenerative disease so these are the concepts which you always have to remember we have to prevent further slip progression that is the first thing and we have various options first is in situ pinning close reduction open reduction surgery so let's let's go briefly with each of them in situ pinning is as the name suggests whatever the deformity is there you just pin it in situ without any attempt to reduction now that is very very important you should say are chal thoda sa reduce karte no it is in situ pinning is in situ pinning you don't attempt any reduction uh so you have a slip like this and it can be fixed in a good manner it's a gold standard for mild to moderate slips right so whenever you have a slip it is a gold standard for a mild to moderate slip it is a percutaneous strict technique low operative time low blood loss and it basically prevents further slip and deform so a, a slip uh, which is mild to moderate which is done well with an in situ can do well provided he may not go into very high level sports he may not do any high flexion activities so if the child is going to have some femoral acetabular impingement he is going to have some out to ingot but overall the risk of avian overall the risk of further progression of the slip is less so that is our concept of doing an in situ pinning now in in situ pinning what is important is that in case so so you these are this is one of the landmark papers which has already been quoted 38 years follow up of a slip we know that this hip is not so good but at that time it was good this was a very captive population from iowa which was described uh, who were basically uh, farmers and they 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 thought that this was a good result um so there has been very recent article by by one of my mentors dr uh, dennis wenger who said that in situ pinning still remains a safe and good method for stable slips so if you do you are not capable not Uh, confident of doing a further procedure do an in situ pin that is a safe method however what can be a practice changing method is something which was described by dr prasad which is an oblique screw 
So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a slip which is completely displaced and you want to try to fix it in a, in a principle where it is perpendicular to the, to the physis, then it will be very difficult to place it because it's a, going to be a very anterior entry. What Prasad described is something which is an oblique screw. So where you enter at a point which is just lateral to the intertrochantric line. And then you try to aim to the center of the head irrespective of where it is in the center of the uh, in the neck. So just to briefly ex explain you, so if you have a physis which is like this, in the conventional means, the screw would have been in this direction. Now that is a very, very difficult trajectory to put. Instead, what Prasad described is this, which is an oblique screw where it enters the physis at the midpoint of the physis, but it is in a direction which is not exactly perpendicular. Now that has some sometimes that is something which has really helped us in doing in situ pinning for moderate slips where we don't want to do a safe surgical dislocation for whatever reasons. Single or double screw again, if it's a stable slip, you do put a single screw. If it's an unstable slip, you may be tempted to put a, put, a, put two screws, but again, it's equal biomechanically. If you are able to put a good single screw, then you can put a good single screw. Now, there have been various means. Uh, close reduction. Now, this was a this was a photo which was described in, in uh, one of the textbooks about close reduction of Schiffy. Then, I, come on, uh, then uh, this is one thing which is, should not be used in any time unless you are actually trained in doing, probably the Japanese are experts in doing a gradual reduction of slips. But again, it is something which I will not advise. And there have been people who say, Ki, are wo fracture table pe rakha aur wo reduce ho gaya. So I, I personally am not a big fan or a big follower of this method or I don't believe that this happens. Because what happens is when you put a patient on a fracture table, your entire team knows how to put the child or a patient on a fracture table like an adult. So in an adult IT fracture fixation, the, the foot is internally rotated or at least made into neutral. Now, if you have a child with sleep SCFE where you want to put it in neutral, then you are already reducing it forcibly. And that is not a gentle or an incidental or a serendipitous reduction. That is a forceful reduction. And that still has a high chance of reduction. But there is one method which is described by Klaus Parsh that is really practice changing. What they do is that it is very important to know that if it's an acute or chronic slip, you go to a level which is prior to the acute episode. Now that is very, very important. So if you have a slip like this, where it's a chronic disorder, chronic slip, and suddenly the child falls. So it's an acute on chronic slip. So what you do is you go by the Smith-Peterson interval, go do a capsulotomy, and just reduce it by putting a small periosteum, periosteum anteriorly, and reduce it till the level of chronicity. You should not try to over reduce it till the perfect reduction. It's a level of chronicity and then fix it in that manner. So it's an in situ pinning after we have put it to a chronic level. So that is the concept of the clause parse method. So if you can see, this is an acute and chronic slip, but where there is a lot of callus here. So you just under reduce it till the level of chronicity. Mm -hmm. and fix it. Right. So again, another article by Dennis Wenger, excellent thing, while they have said that it's a likely safer modification is to open it anteriorly to decompress and to stabilize further and described by Parsh. So that is one which may be useful um, uh, when, when we, we are not very comfortable in doing a surgical dislocation in an acute unstable slip. Next, one method which has now been started doing is in situ pinning with an anterior osteoplasty. So you do an in anterior uh, in situ pinning, open it by the Smith-Peterson interval and just shave off that anterior bump. So it's a safe method. That is, you do an in situ pinning without doing any, any troubling of the vasculature. And then you go anteriorly and shave off that bump. So try to reduce the amount of femoracetabular impingement which the child has. Not many articles about it. There's one method which was an age-old method, which was the anterior approach done for cuneiform osteotomy, where you do an anterior approach, you shorten the neck by doing a cuneiform osteotomy and fix it with the screw. This was described way back in 1964. Initially had good results, but again, it did not stand the test of time. What has 
stood the test of times in the last few years is a method described by this renaissance man dr reynald gans from ben, from burg uh, okay. i think someone else is uh, is unmuted all right so this was the first article which he described where uh, it was basically about the anatomy of the mcfa and its surgical implications and he described these three landmark articles the surgical dislocation of the hip the periacetabular osteotomy and the femoroacetabular impingement and he then extended this article on surgical dislocation to the the slips where he described the capital realignment using the surgical dislocation approach so what exactly is surgical dislocation i am going to describe this in detail but uh, just conceptually it is a trochanteric osteotomy where you flip the trochanter anteriorly you dislocate the head anteriorly create an extensile retinacular flap so as to free this entire femoral head remove the callus from anterior as well as posterior shorten it shorten the neck slightly reduce the femoral head and fix it with one screw and two wires or two screws reduce the femoral head again and fix the trochanter so uh, just briefly a lateral approach digastric flap i'm i'm going slightly faster because there's a full video with it you see that there's this severe bump which is osteotomized the retinacular flap is this which is completely intact which is going preserving the blood supply to the femoral head reduce it seeing you see to it that the head remains bleeding and then fix it in this manner uh it is an extremely technically demanding procedure the operating room staff should be familiar with the procedure uh you should be very careful in doing it in in stable slip because whatever avian is going to happen it's going to happen because of your surgery in this case and we were lucky that we were able to publish this article uh in the indian journal of orthopedics one of the first and largest series of modified done osteotomy for severe slips so this is one of the uh cases in that so take home points so you should remember that it depends on the severity and stability and it has to change over time for most mild to moderate slips remember in situ pinning still remains the gold standard the incomplete acute reduction and pinning method has shown good results in for acute and chronic slips and it does the modified done procedure is still the method of choice for severe slips provided it is provided uh, performed after adequate training so i'm going to stop share here probably we can have a couple of questions till the time we start with the video shalin can do we have a few questions here Yes, we have one question from Molin sir. Is yeah. that with what precautions uh, should we take while doing in situ fixation with Prasad sir's method, and any chances of a posterior breach when we put an oblique screw? Correct, correct. So, so um, what uh, I have started doing is something in between what Prasad describes and what is the conventional method. So there is something known as a universal entry point. So, so, so this is the model of the hip. so this is the intertrochanteric line all right so if we have a slip which is posterior conventionally the 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 entry would have been right anterior here which was intracapsular as against that the entry which prasad describes is somewhere just on the border between the lateral and the uh, anterior surface of the hip this some which is somewhere here what has been described is something which is known as a universal entry point universal entry point is somewhere in between that which is just lateral to the uh, to the intertrochanteric line and it then goes obliquely now this has a very very less chance of having a posterior breach the other thing which i found out after doing a few slips is that we always tend to take an anterior incision because we feel that our in, our entry is going to be anterior in fact what i suggest we take a slightly posterior incision than what is required because if we take an anterior incision and we try to to aim it posteriorly the fascia lata always fights you instead if you are taking a posterior incision to to lift it up anteriorly it is slightly easier so next time when you are doing this in situ pinning for slips try to take a slightly posterior incision than what you anticipate that will be much easier than doing an anterior incision so that is one practical thing which i i i felt i think there is one more question by gaurav i think uh, so, so gaurav sir has asked where 
uh, do you assess vascularity of the head before surgery in, by any means? And what yes. do we counsel for acute slips when we go for a modified burn in those cases regarding right. the AVM? Yeah. All right. So, um, I, so there are some people, I'm so sorry. There are some people who say that we have to do MRI uh, preoperatively to, to know whether uh, uh, the head is vascular or not. I suggest, and this is slightly off the record, you should never do an MRI preoperatively because if the MRI shows a head which is vascular pre-op and it then becomes an AVN postoperatively, you do not have any defense. Your AVN is going to be iatrogenic in this case. As against that, what I do is I always counsel the, pa the patient, especially if he is a candidate for modified done so that he has significant symptoms. I always counsel them that the, the vascularity is in danger and that is where uh, the modified done osteotomy is going to help you to regain that vascularity. So I, I, I always start off with a grim picture that the vascularity is in danger and this is the, this is the uh, method which we are going to use to prevent further our vascularity. So, so that is what... Uh, is, is my approach. I do not do an MRI for any, any slip preoperatively. So that is one thing. Secondly, I think there's one question which is, which is uh, two, uh, what is the difference between done and modified done? Well, done osteotomy classically is an app, is, uh, is a osteotomy which is done through the anterior approach. Well, the modified done is the same osteotomy when you do it through the safe surgical dislocation approach. So that is what Gans has described. Yes, Gaurav. Yes. Sir, I wanted to know if the family asks, what is the chance that your surgery can further damage the vascularity? So I always say that I am I am the firefighter. There is already uh, a lot. The ag lagi hai. Ham ag bujane ka kam kar rahe hai. Jo damage hoga, wo ag ki wajah se hoga. Fire pani ki wajah se nahi hoga. Right, sir. Right. So I always give a grim picture that the head is in danger, and we are doing. A procedure to regain the vascularity of the femoral head. Right. Right. Sometimes we have to be economical with the truth. We can't say that now the head is vascular and then it has become a vascular. So, so there's no defense here. Right. Sir. Right. For research purposes, you can do degeneric MRI and whatever, but uh, we have to be practical in our scenario. Right. The other thing is that MRI doesn't add anything to my surgical plan. A CT definitely definitely adds a lot of things to my surgical plan, and MRI does not. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Doctor Abilas has a question. The yes, very good question. So, any tips to prevent uh, uh, the eye wire bending? So now, a couple of things. As I told you, uh, if you have taken an anterior incision and you are doing a frog leg or you are doing this anterior to posterior screw, then the wire is going to bend. As against that, if you have taken a slightly posterior incision, there is a slightly lesser chance of bending that wire. That is one thing. Secondly, when you are doing an in-situ pinning, always, always, always use a screw which is self-drilling and self-tapping. I think uh, if I am allowed to uh, name the company, it is Zimmer and Senthes that they have these self-drilling, self-tapping, reverse tapping, reverse cutting screws. I don't think they are very expensive. I think they are about 4,000 rupees or so. They have got quite thick guide wires which act like drills. So the thicker the guide wire, that is a better thing. So always use a thick guide wire for doing an in-situ pinning so that it doesn't bend while, while you are doing a frog leg. If you are, uh, if you are doing using a simple 6.5 mm screw set, then that guide wire is extremely flimsy. Especially when you are using in a typical skiffy boy who is about 70 kgs, big 14 year old boy. It is going to bend. So always you may take 4000 rupees less from your surgical fees, but use a better screw in this case. Yeah. Dr. Kaiser has a question. What to do if accidental reduction happens during an in-situ fixation? <laughs> Good question. So, so you don't undo that accidental reduction. 
so uh, just pin it in that manner what uh, so the so this raman has sent a very good uh, uh, tip Sorry. about using a metal section uh, suction tip i'll go a for a slightly further there there is probably an article which has just been published uh, you can check it out about the use of a j needle as a guide sleeve so what what happens is you pass a guide wire on the ap view you feel that your ap trajectory is right and then so you go past midway and then you take a frog leg and you feel that it is very posterior but your entry point is right so what you do is that you take a thicker j needle and you pass it over the guide wire and because that j needle has that bevel you you screw it over it use a slight force so that you take an entry with the j needle into the bone so you have that entry which is fixed then you remove the guide wire and with the help of the j needle act which acts like a drill sleeve which is inside the bone then you can direct it posteriorly in with keeping the same trajectory on the ap view that acts like a sleeve and that acts like a direction finder so that is one thing which is a very good tip which is using a j needle for uh, changing the entry or using the using it as a sleeve for the entry all right so can we can we go for the video yes sir just one sec so mandar yeah molin here now there are many questions in the chat box shalin you can separately ask and we have this fellows group so we can post answers of mandar in that uh, group yeah where we have two more cases to be presented and a nice video so let's go on to the video yeah so um, this is a video which was uh, help uh, which where i was helped by dr shravan and ankita uh, so this was a severe slip as you can see you can see that there is this metaphyseal hibernation so this is this is one sign which i always look for this is metaphyseal smoothing which is not seen in an acute delbay fracture so this is where you differentiate an acute delbay fracture from a slip and you have a lot of callus postromedially right no patient position is very important now this is this has to be dead lateral the other side has to be very very well padded because what happens is that the entire weight of this limb is going to be on that the other side so always remember that you should have a very good padding of uh the other side uh this anterior bum should be well away well above the anterior superior iliac spine of the ipsilateral side so that you should be able to do at least 90 degrees of flexion of this side right so it has to be dead lateral so i have muted the the sound of the video so that i'll be able to uh, uh, speak extempo slightly now this is the draping now one important thing is this anterior sheet now there is a pouch which we have we create so that the leg can fall in it when we are dislocating the head anterior right so fully draped just like probably a, a a bipolar or a thr but with this anterior bump anterior pouch now it is centered on the tip of the greater trochanter about 10 cm superior 10 cm inferior i take a slight anterior curve superiorly just so in the in the direction of the tensor fascia later usually in in a child with skiffy it's a very very uh, usually a very obese child lot of subcutaneous fat and what we all what i always do is a situate that my exposure is very very wide so it's not going to be an incision where the exposure is like this in fact it should be like this so the the internal exposure has to be more than the skin incision and this undermining has to be done at the level of just above the fascia so i always take spend 5 minutes in order to raise the entire entire thick fat off the fascia because what happens is that this really helps me with the dislocation as you can see 
that there's a lot of clearance of the fascia which has happened. Right? Then I cut the fascia distally in the line of the shaft of the femur. And from the tip of the trochanter, I curve it anteriorly, usually between the uh, G, G max and the TFL. Now, this is something which is very important. So, you should know that there is this diagastric flap. Diagastric flap means the gluteus medius proximally and the vastus lateralis distally. You can see on the, on the uh, image here. And this gluteus maximus is curves around and 25% of his insertion in the, is in the gluteal sling, as you can see here, right? So my exposure has to be this wide and the incision for the trochanteric osteotomy has to start from just at the axilla of this gluteal sling, extending right up till the trip tip of the trochanter. Shalin, is everyone getting it? So, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, Mandar. Nice. Yeah. Right. So, so always remember that there's this this cut which is going to go from the base of the shaft here and right up till the tip of the trochanter, so that a few fibers of the gluteus medius are going to be cut. Right. But it is always remain, remain, important to remain on the trochant on the G med side rather on the pyriformis side, right? Now, as you can see, my my direction of the uh, saw is is slightly posterior initially. That is because the entire entire uh, hip is directed external with an external rotation in SCFE, so it's very difficult to go absolutely parallel to the shaft. So what I do is I always take an osteotomy, uh, take the saw initially and use big thick osteotomes which are curled 15 to 20 millimeter osteotomes and then direct them anteriorly like this. You can see that so that it remains flush with the shaft. So it's a sliver of bone which is about 1 to 1 1.5 centimeters thick. So this sliver of bone has to be about 1 to 1.5 centimeters thick like this, right? And we have the digastric flap, which is the gluteus medius here and the vastus lateralis here. And then once I osteotomize, I will flip this entire thing anterior. Now, the only thing which prevents it, this from going anteriorly is the tendon of the gluteus minimus. Now, gluteus minimus is the only tendon which is tenotomized when I'm going to do the trochanteric flip. All right. Once I do that, I see this entire expanse of the anterior hip, right? Like this. Now, there are some fibers of the vastus intermedius here and some fibers of the iliocapsularis here, which is distally. And proximally, we have the gluteus minimus, which is, in, which is arising from the hip capsule. Now, all this is erased when I'm doing this capsular clearance. Right? I'm looking at the hip anteriorly. So proximally, I am going to erase the gluteus minimus and distally, I am going to erase the vastus intermedius and the iliocapsularis. So I want to see the glistening white capsule. Right? So this is the capsule which is seen here. And I go till I feel the acetabulum, acetabular edge and I can feel the, the tendon of the reflected head of the, of the rectus <laughs> right across the superior border of the acetabulum, right here. All right. Then I'm going to do a capsulotomy. Right? Now, this capsulotomy is a Z-shaped capsulotomy. Clear aspect of the femoral neck. And as you can see, there's this hemarthrosis, which is drained, which shows that it is a, it is a uh, acute on or acute unstable slip. You can see that blood oozing out. And then you take this cut right till the level of the acetabular labrum. This is a superior cut. 
so just to explain so if you have the anterior hip the first cut is here the second cut goes right up here and the third cut is here so it's a z shaped capsulotomy which we create so as to create two flaps once we do that we dislocate the femoral head anterior right now this is uh, uh, what we usually do is fix the head with two k wires temporarily when we are dislocating so i unfortunately missed that in this video and then we start creating these retinacular flaps now to understand what is retinacular flaps we should know how is the blood supply so just briefly we have the blood supply the main branch which is coming from the medial circumflex femoral artery just behind the pyre formis which is right here and then it winds around the femoral neck goes superiorly and inferiorly right so anteriorly there is not much of danger to the femoral neck uh, to the blood supply so what we do is we start creating these uh, duns flap and start raising it off right so this entire metaphysis is devoid of periosteum once we have raised it what is very important to know is that the entire cap capital femoral epiphysis is posterior so when we are to reduce this hip this posterior blood supply is not going to allow it unless we create some slack that slack is going to be created by removing this top of this top part of the entire bone here only then will that flap allow that much of stretch so as the femoral head can sit anteriorly right so this is what i'm going to create so i'm going to release all the retinacular flap off the top of the trochanter like this this is a slow process this is where my assistants get tired and bored and think of things at home and at that time slowly i'm going to de denude all this bone from the supra apophyseal portion of the trochanter right so this is the apophyseal scar i'm going to remove everything of the trochanter so that this entire retinacular flap is free so that this supply to the femoral head is completely intact you can see this flap which is going towards the femoral head right once we do that this femoral head becomes very unstable so that is where we usually pack the acetabulum the acetabulum with the help of a roller pack otherwise it just flips back into the acetabular cavity and then we start removing all the callus off here which is a posteromedial callus again this is a very slow process this takes about 15 minutes of slow work to remove that callus and there is also some amount of shortening of the femoral neck which is created so this is how it is the entire metaphysis is devoid of all periosteum the 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 uh, scaphysis is completely curated the posteromedial uh, callus is completely removed <coughs> only then will i be able to get a reduction like this so once everything is everything is released then it's just a simple repositioning of the femoral head it should be without any tension in fact i once i reduce it i usually palpate it posteriorly so as to know that there is no tension on the femoral head then i fix it from retrograde that is from the femoral head towards the shaft keeping in mind that this bleeding continues my usual fixation is usually two wires and one screw there are some people who put two screws and one wire i feel that one screw and two wires are enough this is usually a a 6 32 mm threaded screw uh prasad has uh, tried tried to convince me to put a 16 mm screw so in the last few cases we have used a 16 mm screw this is checked on cm that the position and the reduction is absolutely fine after which we re re uh, remove the pack and then put the the femoral head back in and fix the trochanter with two 3.5 mm screws now there is one tip which is always important is that you should have long screws of 3.5 mm di diameter <coughs> which is the typical size is about 50 to 55 and remember usual 3.5 mm set ends at 
So you should tell your implant guy to see to it that you have long 3.5 mm screws. That is one thing. And secondly, always remember to order for two drill bits. This is what this is one thing which I always tell the primary surgeon to check two drill bits for 3.5 mm screws. Because what you are going to do is you are when you are going to reduce the reduce and fix the trochanter, you fix it with one drill bit, remove the drill, keep that drill bit in place, and then fix the other one, uh, uh, drill the other side, and then put the screw. So if you have to drill it and remove the same drill bit, it's not going to work because because uh, you are going to miss that hole. And this is after a very long, tiring surgery of about three hours. And you are going to be really frustrated when you are trying to fix that trochanter. So see to it that you have two, two drill bits and long 3.5 mm screws. All right. So this is where I'm fixing the, the, the trochanter. And this is the reduction. The other side required an in-situ fixation. All right. Any questions? Shalin, do we so, have any questions? Mandar? Yeah. So what if we find that, uh, you know, the head is not bleeding at that, this point? Yeah. So there are two scenarios. One is if the head is not bleeding at the time of reduction itself, uh, dislocation itself. That, so I have had two cases where the head was not bleeding at the time of reduction, but with my retinacular flap and my reduction, the head started bleeding. So that is one very good scenario where uh, you have actually restored the bleeding. Sometimes it happens that after, uh, at the time of dislocation, as well as after the, at the time of reduction, there is no bleeding. It means that you have probably restored the anatomy, but we, are, we have been unable to restore the blood supply in which you just have to pray to God and then finish the procedure. The third scenario is a thing where you can do something. In case the head was bleeding at the time of dislocation and then it has stopped bleeding after you have reduced it, it is like in a supracondylar, if you have a pulse pre-op and after you have reduced, the hand becomes white, which means that you have done something to the vasculature, which you can probably undo by uh, releasing the retinacular flap slightly more, by shortening the neck slightly more, so as to reduce the tension on the flap. So this third scenario is, is, is the time when we may have to do, take some remedial steps, but in the first two, I think it's, it's all set. Yeah, thank you. Shalin, other questions, please take them. So there are a few questions. Uh, Dr. Anil Agrawal from CNBC has asked that uh, for safe surgical dis dislocation for younger patients, what do you yeah. take care regarding the trochanteric osteotomy? Right. So the young, youngest patient where we have done a surgical dislocation was a seven-year-old child who was a CP hip dislocation uh, multiple times operated. In fact, I, we did it with Prasad where uh, we took thick uh, number one vicryl sutures for trochanter fixation because it was just a sliver of bone which uh, was there. But anything more than nine or ten, we can safely put screws across the physis. Because any which way in, in, uh, the, in one of the steps is that we have to ablate or we have to remove the supraapophyseal portion of the physis completely. So any which way the greater trochanter physis is of not great use. So you can definitely put uh, uh, fixation of screws with uh, for the trochanter at all so, so direction of screws yeah so the direction of screws are always downwards so what um, uh, it, it, it's a slightly tricky thing to fix the trochanter because you all you already have the the two the one or two screws and two k wires there so many a time it hits so what i usually do is do two things one is take the trochanter slightly distally. So that is trochanteric distalization, which is a part of the procedure. But what I also do is take the trochanter and take it slightly posterior. So the, the, that helps in my screw direction slipping across the 
uh, the other screws which may come in the way these screws are always directed downwards my perfect position for these screws is one screw just above the lt and the second screw just below the lt so that is my direction of screws sometimes it doesn't happen that way that they are that way but typically it is one screw just above the lt and one screw just below the lt dr punit is asked whether you fix the head in valgus yeah. so a slight valgus is is acceptable and in, in fact uh, advisable but i try to recreate as much as anatomical reduction as possible dr sujit has asked regarding the 16 mm or 32 mm threaded screws yeah. it's a good question so i don't have a have a have an answer to it intuitively i feel a 32 mm screw is is uh, what is indicated or a fully threaded cancellous screw is what is indicated uh, prasad is of the opinion that you should have 16 mm threads because in this case you want to get good compression i have personally i have not analyzed uh, uh, whether there is a difference in results between 16 or 32 mm th- screws but intuitively i feel that they are equivalent so i think uh, uh, whatever is your preference is fine so please explain the ra- rationale for tro- fixing the trochanter post yeah so there are two rational one is as you said for f- uh, fixation and secondly as you know the trochant the the g med is an anterior structure so it comes from anterior to posterior so the more you tighten it posteriorly there is going to be a good amount of adu- abductor tightness so that abductor lurch is going to be much lesser if you tighten it posterior good okay again so um, i think mandar yeah we are 12 minutes from finishing let's uh, yeah. present let's one case video. yeah and uh, yeah yeah okay so shalin you can present because we will not have much time yes and the l- rest of the questions we can inquire you separately yeah yeah and you can answer and we can spread it to them yeah So for today is today we have a 13 year old boy with a limb so this child who was 13 years old had a tri- history of trivial fall 3 months ago could walk immediately afterwards but he had on and off right side thigh pain since then he had a repeat history of fall 8 days before presenting to us and had uh, and was unable to walk since that uh, second fall with severe pain in the right hip and thigh so on a, when he presented to us his examination showed that the right hip was lying externally rotated right lower limb there was tenderness at the right hip and there was restricted flexion so based on the history and the clinical examination we suspected a slip capital femoral epiphysis and that can, was, can i just uh, interject here just one yes, second sir. yeah so one very important thing of a severity of slip is restricted flexion restricted external rotation uh, internal rotation or an external rotation deformity is going to be there even in a mild slip but if you have a restricted flexion that is something which is very significant and it points to the severity of the slip. so always be wary of restricted flexion yes sir yeah go ahead so that's what we suspected and the radiographs confirmed it to be a slip capital femoral epiphysis a slight a uh, slip was also suspected on the left side also because of the reduced epiphyseal height and uh, the client's line so we did a blood work of the patient the routine blood work was normal the hormonal and the metabolic profile was also normal the bmi was slightly on the higher end so these were the uh, so based on the history the temporal type was acute on chronic with a chronic history and an acute slip after which the child could not walk and based on the functional or the loader type it was an unstable type of slip because the child could not walk on the ipsilateral or affected limb so the x rays showed the client's line passing just above the epiphysis the tuvan sign was positive and uh, it showed uh, some amount of callus formation in the posterior medial aspect and uh, the we measured the south wick angle and uh, it showed the severity of slip to be a severe type so based on this uh, classifications based on the severity of slips we went ahead and planned uh, further 
So this is a recent paper in JBJS by Boston Children's Hospital, and they have graded the slips based on the natural history of the epiphyseal tubercle. And uh, this was some uh, somewhere between stage three and four of uh, the Boston classification. So uh, we considered uh, uh, different uh, methods we could uh, manage this case. So in situ pinning and general reduction and pinning were uh, were ruled out because of the high risk of AVN in this case. So other distal osteotomies were ruled out and uh, modified done osteotomy was considered and we uh, performed this. So as shown earlier by sir, uh, this was the position as described by Gans in his paper with an anterior sterile bag to put the limb while dislocating the hip. This is the this has been described first by Dr. Gans himself in his uh, paper for surgical dislocation in adult hip and has then been described for uh, slip capital femoral lapis as a modified done technique. So the retina cleft flap uh, as described by Sir earlier was developed to prevent the stretch on the posterior vasculature. And uh, the, we have a picture showing the retina cleft flap which was developed. And uh, we could reduce the, uh, reduce the slip intraoperatively and fix it. And after fixing, we could achieve uh, good vascularity. And uh, ultimately, uh, we for for the other side, there uh, we have evidence that uh, 30 to 60 percent of these children develop a contralateral sleep. Endocrine disorders have a higher risk of uh, con developing contralateral sleep. Higher BMI have a higher risk, and age of presentation less than 10 years in boys and less than 12 years in girls have a higher risk. In this case, the BMI was on the higher side. Also, the X-ray showed a mild slip, so we did a contralateral planning. Also, this was the X-ray picture on the uh, modified done osteotomy side, and uh, for the opposite side also, we did an insert opinion. So this was the picture we could uh, we could obtain postoperatively. And that's the, uh, the child is now six months postoperatively and he has achieved a good range, good internal rotation, and he could sit and uh, sit cross legged and squat easily. And this is the X ray picture at six months follow up for the AP view and the lateral view, frog leg lateral view. For this case, we had Dr. Mandasa to assist us. I forgot to add. So, <clears throat> Mandar, your comments on this? Yeah, thankfully it has done well. So, um, so I always uh, look at about six months or one year uh, for development of AVN. So, if the child has not developed AVN by one year, then it is very unlikely that he's going to have AVN. We are about halfway there. So, hopefully after about six months, we'll have the same X-ray. <coughs> Yeah, so the child is doing well. They are happy. Range of motion is well, and the foot progression angle is identical on both sides. Great. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is a very tricky situation, and I would suggest everyone to take help of uh, an expert uh, who is. And after doing few cases together with your other colleagues, you can venture into uh, this procedure. This is something we all should know. And uh, of course, for a fellow to do it uh, in a fellowship is, is probably not possible. But if you have assisted a few and you attend some uh, cadaveric workshop or and you can do these uh, cases. Uh, so one question is, if you see a sign of AVN, now that's one step ahead. Do you uh, recommend zolindronic acid or uh, oral bisphosphonate? Uh, uh, what is your take, Mandar? So, I, I, in case I see ABN on x-rays, then I'll probably give oral bisphosphonates. I have still not had the opportunity or the unfortunate opportunity to give intralegional uh, uh, zolindronate postoperatively. But uh, uh, probably that will be the indication. Right. We have one more question. Uh, any hormone, hormonal therapy for post slip for maturation of physis? So unless, so I, I usually do a few, few basic blood tests, T3, T4, TSH, and uh, yeah. uh, diabetes. I mean, so fasting and post lunch blood sugars. Um, 
so uh, and probably involve an endocrinologist if he's available but post op for maturation of isis i have never given it i don't know whether it is indicated or not right so i think uh, in, yeah one more question yeah, regarding the last protocol yeah. having derotation boot or something to stabilize the leg no derotation boot at all uh, so so just as a brief if you have an in situ pinning for a chronic slip there is no immobilization if the child has come to the hospital walking he goes home walking after an in situ pinning for a safe surgical dislocation what i do is i usually give a knee brace to prevent or at least decrease active knee active hip flexion i encourage bedside movements i usually give a bit of abduction pillow just for the child to prevent a uh, drastic adduction i allow leg dangling i allow them to sit on a chair once they are comfortable they can be made to walk with a walker non weight bearing i allow them partial weight bearing at around 6 weeks looking at the trochanteric healing so it's a trochanteric healing which decides whether the child goes back goes to weight bearing or not so typically the child starts bearing weight completely at around 8 10 to 12 weeks and so i do not yeah. perform capsular repair in ssd uh, and, and other than probably just one or two tag sutures of the capsule i do not want a complete tight taps capsular closure especially in an acute or chronic acute or an unstable slip because that itself is going to cause capsular tamponade and that may be a factor for avian so i just to approximate those retinacular flaps i require that approximation of the capsule so just one or two capsular sutures and that should be enough fine so this this concludes today's one hour it was a fantastic uh, morning mandar thanks, mm-hmm. thanks. nice talk uh, beautiful uh, video and uh, at one point we had around 42 fellows and consultants attending this meeting so i think it's a nice uh, gathering of uh, uh, aspiring fellows thank you shalin for uh, uh, coordinating this shinam you have to present your case next week because that will probably more suitable time when sandeep patwardhan is going to talk about my approach to skeffy so friends let's meet next week uh, with uh, dr sandeep's session and i again thank mandar for a good beginning you thank like you sachin so sachin tendulkar <laughs> thank you chalo take care take, take care bye 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 everyone thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.